Vegetarianism. Meaning simply that in the home, men, husbands, should be humble, kind, patient, loving, strong, leading, protecting, providing, teaching leaders of their wives and children. Heads, we call them, heads. And the wives should be happy about that, endorsing that, and blessing that. We call that submission. And in the church, we believe that men, not women, are called to be the Christ-like, humble, strong, loving, teaching, responsibility-bearing, enemy-facing elders in the church. Now, it's very controversial. And we're totally there as an eldership. That's on paper. You don't have to believe that to be a member of this church. You can be egalitarian to the core and join this church. You're just going to hear complementarianism over and over and over again because that's what the role of an elder is. You take people wherever they are on these kinds of things and you try to persuade them it's in the book. And then if it's in the book, okay, must be good for my marriage and this church. And then you grow up into it. We don't put a guard at the front door saying only complementarians coming into this church. No way. That would be an awful way to define the body of Christ. That's where we want the body of Christ to go and grow. But a baby Christian, this woman who's 45 years old, been single all of her life, runs a bank, egalitarian to the max, gets saved... Can she join? Yes, of course she can join. Other examples. You don't have to believe in unconditional election, total depravity, irresistible grace, definite atonement of Christ, perseverance of the saints, absolute sovereignty of God. And the elders love those doctrines. We would die for them in a minute. And you don't have to believe any of them to be a member in this church. Take a deep breath. You see where this leads? As a member of this church, you can be wrong on election, you can be wrong on the power of sin, you can be wrong on the extent of the atonement, you can be wrong on the power of grace, you can be wrong on perseverance, you can be wrong on the sovereignty of God, but you can't be wrong on baptism. Should you be able to be wrong on baptism? That's the issue. So that's where we are. Now I have a few minutes to address this one more time. What would you say if you finished this sermon? I just wonder how you'd go about this. If you had 15 minutes now, and I said, you finish the sermon, I'm I'm just going (laughs) to... You figure this out. I don't know what you would do. I said, I prayed a lot about this. I prayed for months about this. I knew this I knew this series was coming in April. And and I have sought the Lord and I I think I know where He wants me to go and and us to go on on this. And it it might surprise you and and uh, so give me, if you would, your ear. I think that what we should do, what what elders should do, like me now, who have responsibility here for leadership, is to step back from the micro issue of that and, and look at the macro issue of Bethlehem. The macro issue of relationships. The macro issue of a relational culture at this church. The the question should be asked. Okay, not what button can you push to just fix it, but rather what process or kind of community life can you nurture in which wisdom would be birthed that in due time would amazingly, beyond all expectation, draw this church together in an answer to that question. 
So that's where I'm going to try to go. I want to talk about the cultivating of a process of life together. That, that's an awful phrase. I wrote that down and I thought, that is so sterile. Uh, cultivating of a process of life together. I don't like the phrase. I'm stumbling. I'm, I'm groping for words that aren't worn out here on what I'm, I'm after. Uh, so I'm, I'm hitting on this phrase, um, relational culture. I got the word culture from John Bloom. I was bouncing these ideas off of him Friday morning. Uh, John's the executive director of Desiring God, and John's so wise. He's just wise way beyond his years. Very helpful to me. And, and we were talking about the culture of Bethlehem. And what it needs. And that's what I'm talking about. So when you think culture, don't think, you know, big global thing. But, but just think ethos. Is that helpful? Atmosphere. Spirit. Esprit de corps. I mean, whatever word works for you to try to capture the, the non-definable air we breathe as a people when we're together or in our small groups or in Sunday school classes or in committee meetings or in worship services or hanging out afterwards. What is this? What is it like? And what should it be like? Because it seems to me God cares a lot about that and He has ordained that there be a kind of relational culture in which He has ordained for wisdom to be birthed. I think that relational culture would be marked by an intentionality and a radically servant-like, other-oriented, thoughtful, outgoing, humble, thankful, aggressively concerned and caring, moving into the lives of others, not moving away from others, committed to the hard work and the sweet rewards of growing relationships. as the flavor I'm talking about. The culture I'm talking about. Discerning wisdom in how to relate baptism and church membership, discerning that micro-issue, I think, has to be moved toward by moving toward a macro culture, a macro atmosphere, spirit, among the people in which they don't just say, que sera, sera, we like each other so much, those differences don't matter, but rather in which supernatural wisdom is awakened. Let me show you where I get this idea from the Bible. Colossians chapter 3. That is the idea that a way forward is to not focus on the micro problem, but the macro culture of the church assuming a certain kind of church culture gives rise to wisdom that solves problems that seem unsolvable. Okay. Here we are at Colossians 3. We're going to start in verse 16. I'm going to pinpoint the phrase that drew me to this text. So why did you choose this text out of the whole Bible, because as I was pleading with the Lord for help, my attention was drawn to a phrase in this verse. It goes like this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another, and here's the phrase, in all wisdom. That's the phrase that arrested my attention. At the immediate level of issue, that's what we need, right? Right? We need that. Let me pause here with a little kind of Old Testament parenthesis. Tell you a story. You know the story. It's really enjoyable to talk about this story because it's so absolutely amazing. The most practical, down-to-earth, in-your-face, on-the-ground, nitty-gritty, gutsy story about the gift of wisdom is in 1 Kings 3. 